Auto scaling helps you size up to handle increased demand and size down to avoid paying for resources that you're not using. That's not just limited to your pods, it can also apply to the machine side. Today, we'll talk about auto scaling infrastructure with Google Kubernetes Engine and cover some best practices. Let's go beyond your GKE bill. In the last video, we covered how auto scaling works and went over horizontal and vertical pod auto scaling. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend checking it out since we'll look at some additional ways that you can configure auto scaling and how that can help you with cost optimization. I'll start by going over the cluster auto scaler and then something really cool, node auto provisioning. Then we'll wrap up with some tips to use when setting up your auto scaling. So if pod auto scalers can help you resize or add additional pods, what can you do with the infrastructure side? Well, just like the pod auto scalers, you can think of the same horizontal and vertical options for infrastructure. This time, we're talking about changing the number of nodes or automatically creating additional node pools with optimized size. This is really where the cloud and Kubernetes work well together, since the cloud tends to give you a lot more flexibility with your resources. Let's start with horizontally adding more nodes, which is done by the cluster autoscaler. The cluster autoscaler is designed to add or remove nodes based on demand. But this time, demand is actually based on pod scheduling and requests. If additional pods aren't able to be put into the existing nodes that are running, the cluster autoscaler will create a new node so that the pods can get placed. You can, and should, use the cluster autoscaler along with the horizontal or vertical pod autoscalers. That way, as you create more or larger pods, your infrastructure can grow alongside them. It's also important to note that the cluster autoscaler is perfect for cost optimization since it's actually built to prefer lower costs. That means that the autoscaler will start by trying to create additional nodes of the cheapest type and then move to more expensive node types if it can't create the cheaper ones. Isn't it great when cost optimization is just built right in? Just like the pod autoscaler, having an appropriate pod disruption budget is important for having an effective cluster autoscaler. The budget defines the minimum number of running pods for your workload. So when the cluster autoscaler is removing nodes, you can ensure that your workload will still be running correctly. Now, there are some pods that can't be restarted, which will then block the cluster autoscaler from removing a node. System pods like kubedns and pods that use local storage are examples of pods that can't be restarted by default. For system pods, you can set a pod disruption budget, which will allow them to be rescheduled on another node, freeing up their original node to be deleted. But you may not want to set a budget for some system pods that only have one replica, like metric server, since restarting them can cause temporary disruptions. For pods with local storage, you can enable a special annotation called Safe to Evict to let the cluster autoscaler know that they're safe to be restarted. If you have any pods that are supposed to run for a long time without being restarted, you might want to move those over to a separate node pool so that they don't block the cluster autoscaler. There's also a few more things to think about when using the cluster autoscaler. Make sure to figure out how to read the cluster autoscaler logs so that you can understand any unexpected actions. If your workload can support it, see if you can use preemptible VMs, since those will be prioritized by the cluster autoscaler and could save you a lot of costs. But don't forget to have a backup node pool in case there's any trouble with creating new preemptibles when they're needed. Set your minimum nodes by figuring out the minimum capacity needed to keep your workloads running without disruption, so you don't end up with idle nodes. So the cluster autoscaler helps add and remove nodes in response to pods needing to be rescheduled. However, GKE specifically has another feature to scale vertically called node auto provisioning. Node auto provisioning actually adds new node pools that are sized to meet demand. Without node auto provisioning, the cluster autoscaler will only be able to create new nodes in the node pools that you've specified. This is perfect for helping optimize resource usage for workloads and other apps that don't need extreme scaling. Since creating an optimized node pool might take some more time than just adding additional nodes to an existing pool. It's pretty cool to have node pools created based on what best fits your application. And as long as your apps support interruptions, you can save even more costs by setting your pods to be preemptible tolerant, allowing the audio provisioner to create preemptible node pools. A few other things to keep in mind. Consider how each of your autoscalers will affect your apps and make sure that you've spent the time to configure each of them properly. New node pools can take a bit longer to be created than simply adding more pods or nodes, 
So you may want to adjust the metric value of your horizontal pod autoscaler to, to create additional pods sooner. Set minimum and maximum resource sizes based on what your apps need so that the node auto provisioner doesn't interfere with keeping your workload running. With all four types of autoscalers that we've talked about, there's a lot of configuration options that you can use to customize your GKE clusters. Effective use of some or all of these can really maximize your cost optimization. But it's also important to understand how long it might take to scale resources, especially if you're expecting large spikes. Let's walk through what scaling up looks like when demand increases. For both horizontal and vertical pod autoscaling, they'll respond by adding pods or resizing pods, depending on the settings that we talked about in the last video. On the infrastructure side, if there's room on your existing nodes that have already deployed your app, it might be able to skip pulling the image and just start running the application. If you're working with a node that hasn't deployed your application before, a bit of time might be added if it needs to download the container images before running it. But if you don't have enough room on your existing nodes and you're using Cluster Autoscaler, it could take even longer. Now it needs to provision a new node, set it up, and then download the image and start up pods. If the node auto provisioner is going to create a new node pool, there will be even more time as you provision the new node pool first and then go through all the same steps for the new node. In order to handle these different latencies for autoscaling, you'll probably want to over-provision a little bit so that there's less pressure on your apps when scaling up. This is really important for cost optimization because you don't want to pay for more resources than you need, but you also don't want your apps to struggle. Let's go through two strategies for figuring out how to over-provision using a pretty simple formula. We'll start with the formula that you can use to find an optimized target for using horizontal pod autoscaling. The first thing we'll want is an appropriate buffer target for the application to ensure that everything is running smoothly. Let's choose a buffer size of about 15% so that we can keep the application safely away from 100% CPU utilization. Then we can take a look at the percentage of traffic growth that we might expect in a two to three minute period. Here, let's say that we expect a growth of about 30%. With these numbers in the formula, we can calculate a target for the horizontal pod autoscaler around 65%. This generally means that we'll be about 35% over provisioned in order to appropriately handle the expected traffic growth while still minimizing extra resources. If you're using larger nodes and smaller workloads with consistently less traffic than requested, you could consider over-provisioning a bit less since there might be room to go above 100% utilization. The second strategy is to use pause pods. These are low priority deployments, which mean that they could be removed and then replaced by high priority deployments. Since these pause pods aren't actually doing anything, they're basically just reserving buffer. When the higher priority pod needs room, the pause pod will be removed and rescheduled to another node or a new node, and the higher priority pod has the room it needs to be scheduled quickly. Using these can help because node spin up time can happen without affecting the high priority pods. It's basically like scaling a little bit ahead of when you need to, since they'll be spun up before they're needed thanks to those low priority pods. It's a good idea to try and only use one pause pod per node, so it's quick to be rescheduled, the API isn't overloaded with even more requests, and the full node will be available quickly. Whew, all right, that's a lot to think about for autoscaling, and pause pod is really hard to say. Once again, it's important to know what your apps can handle and to optimize around that. But you can also optimize your apps. On the next video, we'll cover different ways to do exactly that. Remember to check out the link in the description for the full guide on GKE cost optimization.